This is Jake Gallen, and you are tuned into the guest list. What's up, Las Vegas? Today on the show, I have Peter Klamka. He is the current CEO of Cordia Kitchens, which owns the local restaurant, The Blind Pig. I know a few of you guys have been there. I've been there before. It's over on Dean Martin behind the Aria. And before this, Peter was a little bit of an entrepreneur, I would say. He uh, worked in New York for 20 years in the financial landscape of investment banking, private equity, small hedge funds. And he has also ventured into industries of marijuana and CBD. And my personal favorite, and all my listeners know, the cryptocurrency space, which I'm always talking about, and the Bitcoin halving is in a, in a few days. So I know we're going to touch on that as well. And so, Peter, I thank you for coming on to the show. And how are you doing? Oh, great. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Like I said, I love the Vegas backgrounds landscape. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. I, I, you know, I do some of these that are not local to Vegas. And so everybody's like, oh, that's so cool. Oh, you know, uh, uh, are you sitting right there? I'm like, yes, I'm sitting right on Las Vegas Boulevard <laughs> right now by myself since there's no traffic on Las Vegas Boulevard. Yeah. One, one of my friends actually made a popular video that was trending around and it was just like the desolate nature of the strip right now and just walking around. It blends in like how Vegas used to be busy and walking through it now with this like eerie sound. And yeah, uh, no, it's, it's, it's real. It is, it is real. You can bowl down Las Vegas Boulevard and still go get your ball and pick up your pins. Yeah, Vegas, uh, unfortunately, we're probably going to be one of the hardest hit cities um, in this aftermath. And I think that's um, something that you noticed, um, which I didn't mention, is that you have a unique approach to the restaurant industry. And I guess this pandemic's only going to speed it up. But Peter advocates for ghost kitchens and virtual restaurants time and time again. And um, is this something that you are moving forward out of the blind pig? Um, started at the blind pig. And so what happened was um, I noticed that delivery was becoming more and more part of our business, both the delivery apps, the to-go orders, the delivery to the local restaurant, uh, local um, uh, hotels and the uh, uh, condos that, that are behind us. And fewer and fewer people are uh, actually wanting to sit down in a restaurant before pandemic, right? And so the joke was that it's just kids who want to get takeout, play video games, and consume legal marijuana at Panorama. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, uh, that was the joke. But really, more and more of our business was going that way. And so the, the overall trend in restaurants is away from dine-in and more to go. And so as somebody was looking at where my margins could be, where I can make the most money, it had to be in the delivery space. And um, I have, uh, um, so we were going in that direction beforehand. We were working on the ghost kitchen concept, working on celebrity virtual restaurants. And um, this has just accelerated, uh, accelerated. All of our business now is to go small catering and the app, uh, uh, app-based orders. And then um, the next step, which hopefully will be out in the next month or, or, or so, will be a, a celebrity-based virtual restaurant meaning that it will be, I don't think the next Gordon Ramsay is going to launch in a brick and mortar location on Las Vegas Boulevard. They're going to launch in an app. They're going to launch in an app that's made in some place that you can't go sit down in. You look on your phone and you pick out the, you know, the Migos burger or whatever happens to be uh, uh, the, the uh, um, celebrity of the, uh, uh, of the moment. So. Um, those are the two areas that uh, we've been looking at. We have uh, a, our base here in Las Vegas, and then we are close to launching in Los Angeles. And then sadly, we've been offered restaurants around the country because they're all going out of business. So, so there are a few portions to dissect out of that. Uh, I want to dive into the ghost restaurant, restaurant aspect because delivery is prominent. You know, I'm a young millennial. Um, I, I personally cook from home, but I can tell you my neighbors, I see Uber Eats and DoorDash and all these different ones coming through three, four times a day. So a lot of people are trending towards that convenience. And so 
through a ghost kitchen, are you providing the delivery service? Or are you partnering with these delivery service apps? So it depends. Um, in a centrally located location like we have, the first location, which is the Blind Pig location on Dean Martin, there's pickup. And we also have our delivery apps. And then we will also, within a certain mile, a certain mile range, deliver for you. And that's obviously better for most customers um, because it cuts out the enormous fees that uh, uh, they see on their app. There's a, a sticker shock when they see the delivery fee, the tip, the service fee, the use your phone fee, a, a <laughs> $20 pizza becomes $50 really quickly. And you're like, wait, what happened? So uh, uh, that's, an, uh, uh, that, that's an issue. Um, and then there are other locations that we are looking at that will have no pickup. They will just be uh, in different parts of the city. We've looked at Summerlin, we've looked at downtown, we've looked at uh, uh, the way out in Henderson, um, and they'll have no pickup. Those are just going to be a closed restaurant that we take over the lease for, and that will be uh, uh, just app-based. I think downtown would actually be a really good spot for that. That's they're trying downtown's trying to move into that like trendy towards nature for young millennials. I'm actually moving down there and with the downtown project, they're doing all these creative esque projects. So I think that that's no actually question. Really good fit. As, well, well, real estate's a little cheaper down there, although real estate's going to be cheap everywhere pretty <laughs> soon. Um, and then uh, um, that area has density. And it's not just the people at home. It's people who work in bars that are there doing inventory that order lunch. It's people that work in all the little businesses around there, the gift shops and everything else da down there that will order the uh, uh, that will order delivery. I mean, we deliver to gas stations. We deliver to, to all over. It doesn't really uh, uh, doesn't really matter. So uh, anywhere people want to eat, um, they'll deliver. And downtown has a great density, and uh, I think that uh, uh, that's an area that we're, we're aggressively looking for the right deal. And so with these, with these ghost kitchens, um, are you afraid of the ticket price being lower per check? Because you know, when, when people go out to a restaurant, they tend to spend more, they'll get alcohol or they'll buy appetizers or somebody will end up picking up the check. So the, the ticket price ends up being more, but I know when people tend to order out or delivery. I know I do this as well. You tend to look for like the value within sure. the, the restaurant. Do you have a fear? Or do you think the quantity will um, so increase two because of that? To that? No fear because a ghost kitchen changes the economics because I don't have the entire staff I'm paying. Right? I'm paying the staff whether there's 10 people in the restaurant or 100 people in the restaurant. So I, can, I have much lower overhead if I don't have all the staff, if I don't have the staff serving the dine-in customer, I have, you know, two or three chefs or cooks and uh, two people to manage the orders versus blind pig, you have 50 people on the payroll. I mean, different, it, it just that your cost goes down, um, your margins are better, uh, and you can also, so we have much more data. You know, the other thing is you're throwing darts when you put a menu together. But we have data from, from you know, all the delivery services, from our own experience. Ah, okay, hamburgers, chicken sandwiches, one salad, and uh, two pasta dishes sell. You don't, you're not experimenting. You're not throwing away any food. You're not making any guesses because the data drives what goes on the menu. So you can have, high, you have higher margins because your overhead is less. You sell more product because you know exactly what they're going to buy. We even know the times when you're going to buy it. And we know that, I mean, think, oh yeah, there are times of the day, night, middle of the night, where you can, where you know from, from the data that you get from the delivery services. Uh, so I think that you can deliver lower cost, better value, and you have lower overhead for the delivery space. Okay, that makes sense. Will the restaurant be a traditional Vegas restaurant where you will have delivery 24-7? Especially since you are on the Strip, a lot of your people who live by the Strip are going to want delivery. No question. I mean, there, there's no question that you have people who are coming out from, from they, they come out from the club at three o'clock in the morning. You have uh, uh, unlucky guys who are on their way home that want something at 4.30. You've got service workers that, that uh, uh, so the answer is, no question yes okay yeah i've actually stopped by the blind pig on my way home from work a few times over the past few years i haven't been in there yeah, recently no. but and then 
you contrast this with LA where the clubs close at two o'clock in, in, in the morning. <laughs> so you don't really, you know, three, three thirty is, is, is you can have a cutoff and then you can get ready for, uh, uh, for breakfast. Okay. And so, so I have two questions. First, when, when did you become the owner of the blind pig? And then second, so I, when, uh, when did you have the idea to pivot into this movement? Like what? So you- 2017, uh, 2017, uh, I, I uh, had the opportunity to buy it. Um, and, um, I coming from New York city, my thought was, oh, there's 1200 apartments behind it and there are 600 hotel rooms next door. So as long as I control my costs, I will always have a ongoing base of business, deliver good food, reasonable price to the 5,000 people that are walking in walking distance of the place and you'll be okay. And then I got the benefit of not sure what, when the benefit's going to come, but the Raiders stadium up a mile away, you know, there, there's where there aren't many restaurants. There's in and out burger and the blind pig between, uh, uh, between uh, uh, Dean Martin and the stadium. So uh, uh, and we've got all kinds, you know, people wanted to rent the parking lot and the tailgating there, all kinds of interesting things have come about pre-virus no one knows what's going to happen happen there but our takeout will be just uh uh you know if they play and they play on television takeout will be uh um uh, uh will be will compensate yeah um I, who knows if the raiders will play or at least there'll be fans there but i can guarantee you next year during the tailgates you guys will be able to deliver to a handful or a ton of people or even spark into maybe the catering services. Well. Oh, huge. Yeah. 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 I mean, te- we've already had, pre- we had preliminary conversations with uh, uh, the UFC about doing things like this. I mean, Dana did one of his 12 days of Christmas giveaways from the restaurant. And uh, uh, we were, we were looking for a way to tie into either when people come to town for like live events or tie into the, uh, uh, pay-per-view purchases, um, sort of gotten, gotten sidetracked a little bit given the situation, but there's no question there's a tie-in between delivery uh, and events, whether it be here or Las Vegas or New York, um, there, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a tie-in, so. Interesting, and so, okay, so we, we've established what a ghost kitchen is, and then you touched on a virtual restaurant, which was, it's basically like a sponsored restaurant from right. somebody? So, so, you know, you can go to any number of celebrity chef restaurants in town and, um, and not just here, but anywhere. And the thinking is that you, a chef, a brand can open up their own restaurant on the app. They can op- you can open up a, uh, a silver and black Raiders sponsored cafe that's just on an app. You can open up the Celine Dion Montreal style uh, uh, restaurant on an app. Um, if it works, you can then take it and have a brick and mortar location. If it doesn't work, you say it was a great promotion um, and it was for the fans or it was for the term of the residency or it was for the, the launch year and it goes away. But it's an interesting way for, and, and especially now, right? No celebrities are doing anything. There's no tours, there's no movies. The, the only merchandising deals that are coming to them are, are masked merchandising deals. So, and this is something that, that I've been involved in for a long, long time. So we're just picking the highest impact spot and we will roll that, uh, uh, that out. But I've been talking with talent agencies for about six months and the response has overwhelmingly been, yes, uh, do I have to cook the food and can I have a complete say over the menu? So just like a, any kind of licensed experience, um, somebody could go on and get the, the uh, um, branded, whether it be menu from a particular uh, uh, brand. It doesn't have to be a celebrity. It can be the Hello Kitty online cafe. It can be the Star Wars online, uh, online restaurant. We even had a conversation, but it didn't go, uh, uh, didn't go where we needed it to go um, with a movie studio that wanted to do pop-ups around movie releases. So, um, and you can take that up and put that down very, very quickly. So virtual restaurants are uh, uh, definitely something that you'll see more of and that we hope to be one of the pioneers. in. I just saw dollar signs just going through my eyes as you're talking about that, especially those uh, two buildings that are right behind you. Let's say you get a handful of celebrities or conventions who are staying in the Cosmo, which is right next to the restaurant. 
and they want food or they're going to try out a seven day trial because they're in Vegas for seven days and they're sponsoring, let's say a hot dog restaurant or whatever the case is. Yep. And they have 400 people in their parties renting out a hundred rooms and they say order from this restaurant and you know, they get their, they get money back or they can disperse that revenue back towards discount off their own rooms. Or their I created the kiss visa card with Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley many years ago. And you had people, we, we had the highest annual fee. We had high interest rates. And we still had tens of thousands of people who felt the affinity to that brand to go to, uh, uh, to use our credit card. So this is the next, uh, uh, next evolution of just branding for celebrities, personalities. Also, if you want to see if your brand is a good extension into the food space, it's really easy to try it and test it. And the cool thing about Las Vegas is, let's assume you get back to a lot of people coming. You've got a great cross section of not only the United States and the world. And so you can tie it in with residencies, movie launches, shows, sporting events, almost anything. Yeah. Vegas is everyone's second home. That's why I always made the, I always made the claim that the Golden Knights and the Raiders were going to be the international teams because everyone has a tie to it. Right, right, right. Yeah. No question. You have that. You can have the Calvin Harris to go. (laughs) There's no end. You know, there really isn't an end. And uh, uh, as long as you, uh, uh, you know, deliver a quality experience and customized packaging so you can get just like going in and getting like the happy meal, you can get a specialized Calvin Harris decorated package, right? Uh, and that's the to-go box. And inside of it, who, we had one celebrity who said, maybe I'll deliver the food. Maybe like during the weekend, uh, it'll be a, a, a great PR event and I'll go to the guy's house and drop off the food. That's- so I mean, it's, it's great from a PR standpoint and to energize a fan base. Dude, yeah, that's awesome. That's like the, uh, have you ever seen the Cameo app where they get celebrities to okay. give like a shout out to people? It's like the right. food, it's like the, it's like the food version of that. Right. And everybody, everybody, when you're that famous, you think, oh, I know what tastes good. I'm a celebrity. I know what, what I like. And uh, so it goes from there. Okay. So I do, I do like the idea. My, my question would be, are you afraid or what would prevent people from essentially ripping you off since it's almost like a, it's like a multi-tool kitchen that can represent multiple restaurants? Are you afraid of people copying you or does so, it just bring in, the, bring in everyone? So it does two things. First, I've done this before in the credit card space. So I created celebrity credit cards uh, many years ago and I worked with Kiss and Hello Kitty and the current president of the United States and Walt Disney, and um, I think one other, NASCAR, right? So I, had, I went in and got, bought the rights or secured the rights for those five brands and did amazingly well. And I see the exact same thing now. Um, sure, there'll be competition. Sure, there will be a, uh, uh, another virtual restaurant. <clears throat> but if I pick well and have five awesome uh, uh, restaurants and deliver five uh, uh, or 10 or whatever it is, um, one of them will become my George Foreman Grill. And so that's sort of how I, I look at it as we're early stage in the category, but we've done celebrity licensing forever and we'll pick the right ones. It's a very early stage. I've actually never even heard of the idea. I mean, you see the trends going towards it, but they're all individual uh, restaurants, but being able to basically swap out the title as many times as you need with whoever is supporting it is, right. is the right. way that trend is going it's it's just all about distributed systems which is where everyone is going you know podcast is almost the same where people are going away from one central product and the one product can offer multiple um, ideas or uses as the case goes yeah no question it really is a the underlying product just needs to be differentiated and it's differentiated by the brand okay and so will my question is will you accept bitcoin um, so there's no question um, we would accept cryptocurrency. There's no question uh, we are experimenting or looking for ways to incorporate crypto as a reward system, crypto as a, a, a way to pay, crypto to enhance the need for contactless payments that are going to be the next big thing. So, I mean, whether it be the apps, whether it be the, you could pay in Bitcoin now at the blind pig if you wanted to. The One of the managers has got a, a wallet on his phone. And if somebody wanted to come in and buy a, a to-go order with, uh, uh, with, with Bitcoin, they would uh, happily take it. So uh, the people who work for me have all been indoctrinated, drank the Kool-Aid, and uh, appreciate the power of uh, crypto. 
Yeah, and you, I mean, you see the power of, I mean, you, we see the Fed just printing money into oblivion and you have a 20 year history working in New York financial instruments. And so you've, from what I read when I had looked you up is that you've been in Bitcoin since 2013 and you've harnessed that power since. 2013, two kids came into my office. I was working at a small fund. Two kids came into my office to pitch us on a, uh, an exchange. And my two older partners who wear plaid pants and play golf, um, they skipped out on the meeting. They were like, nah, this is stupid. Computer money, uh, you know, PayPal's fine. And uh, so I listened to the pitch and uh, we never actually, I don't think they ever got their exchange together, but that was my first introduction in 2013 uh, to crypto was to, uh, I don't, I, they were probably still in college, uh, came in looking for uh, some money for this uh, Bitcoin exchange in New York City. And I was like, I don't, I didn't know that they were going to be the right guys to execute on this. And I didn't have enough knowledge in, in, in the space to be able to, to mentor it. So I didn't want to risk the, uh, uh, the firm's money because I was betting the firm's money. Um, this was a, uh, uh, but it was my introduction to Bitcoin and how it could work and Satoshi and all of that. And uh, so then I started with Bitcoin ATMs in New York City. So See, that's a huge, yeah, there's over 20,000 now all over the world because of that. Yep. And it all started, it started very, very slowly. And, and my position on Bitcoin ATMs has changed a little bit since it was back then, uh, because it's so much easier to buy Bitcoin now, Coinbase and Square and, 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 you know, you can set up accounts fairly easily. Um, back then there was none of that. I mean, it was the, the machine. My first machine had a wallet of $250 in it. And, uh, uh, and it took a week to sell it all. That's how it started in 2013. Oh, dude, yeah. I've been in, I've read all the books, Bitcoin Billionaires and Research and all the altcoins. And we know the Bitcoin having is next week. I'm actually doing a Bitcoin special episode next week because of the enthusiasm behind it. Yeah, of it. course. There's no, <laughs> uh, uh, no question. It's definitely, uh, and I think the, the current situation uh, will accelerate. Uh, look, I, I have a cryptocurrency, uh, as we talked about before we came on air, and, and uh, it's a me- using crypto for a membership-based nightclub, restaurant, private dinner thing. And we've had a significant number of venues contact us to say, maybe we don't want a line of unwashed, untested masses standing outside our door at six feet. Maybe we can develop a membership concept. Maybe we can use, uh, um, you know, maybe we can use crypto for contactless payments in clubs and entertainment venues. I mean, there's definitely in the post-COVID world a growing place for for crypto outside for an actual use case, not just for investment speculation or uh, uh, an inflation hedge. Yeah, so you've definitely dove into this before, and can you expand a little bit more on your cryptocurrency? Uh, just the name, the name of it. Um, the idea behind it and what the use is. Sure. So in 2017, um, and and I have a close relationship with an exchange called Bittrex. Great guys, uh, uh, just an amazing, uh, 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 amazing uh, uh, crew in uh, in Seattle. And uh, uh, so they were sort of the sponsor for my uh, membership coin. So moving to Las Vegas, I had belonged to a number of private clubs in New York City. Some were related to where I went to school, some were related to my profession, and some were just, you know, fun places that Soho house type places. So it was my vision to create something like this using crypto. And so we created the More Coin, which got you private access to a couple of special places inside a VIP area of a nightclub, inside a a Las Vegas gentleman's club. Uh, We had deals with exotic car rentals. We did celebrity dinners. I've had 21 Savage, Damon John, Cardi B, Migos, g Easy. I mean, they've all come and performed uh, or hung out with my, uh, with my members. Um, and so that's the basis of the, uh, the membership. Uh, and you can, we pass along some of the savings on the tables and the bottles and the experiences. Uh, some of the margin gets passed along to the, uh, to the memberships. And this is listed on Bittrex or it's privately on Bittrex. held? It is. No, it's on Bitrex. It's called More, uh, and uh, uh, so that's uh, um, and and it, in in round two, uh, which would be the post-COVID world, um, I see memberships 
being a uh, um, more important part of the club experience. And I also see memberships, like we've thrown marijuana dinners, um, where we've had a marijuana chef come in and make a private dinner for members. And some of them had infused dinners, some of them had CBD dinners, some of them just had uh, uh, you know, just a regular, uh, a regular dinner. But it was exclusive, uh, it had that interesting menu, and that's another area that we have where we create experiences for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, our members. Right. Yeah. That's uh, the younger generation, my generation. We're all, we're all about the experience. And right. And, and, you know, we have had, we've taken them to the UFC and had ex UFC guys come and explain and hang out and we've done all of that kind of stuff. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. We've seen people try to dive into the uh, Bitcoin experience. There was a Bitcoin strip club at some point a few years ago. I was involved with that. Really? I was involved with setting that up. Correct. Yeah, I, forget, uh, I forget what the name was, but I remember Legends seeing, Room on Valley View and Twitter. Yeah, it had the QR code uh, tattooed onto the girls. That was my idea, actually. And, uh, uh, and uh, it got a lot of great press. Um, and it would still be in existence. Well, I don't think the strip club business is ever coming back. I think that's dead. Until there's a va- vaccine, I think that, that it's going to be very difficult to have that same experience, whether it be Vegas, Miami, LA, it doesn't matter. It's... Uh, uh, you know, until you can prove you've been COVID free or tested or whatever, I don't think the lap dances are going to happen anymore. That's funny you say that. My last episode was actually with the co-founder of Swan Nevada, which is the Sex Workers Alliance of Nevada. And they're talking about how they, they just did a talent show virtually because of the right. safety requirements behind it. So everyone's trying to innovate in different ways because a lot of people see that COVID is changing the future forward and it's a huge accelerant towards it. Well, take it from the standpoint of if you're a performer in one of those clubs, how do you uh, uh, know that everybody coming in who are coming in here from all over the world, how do you know? They're asymptomatic. They lie. They, I mean, if you're, you're a dancer there, you're like, ooh, I'd rather make more money on OnlyFans or I'd rather make more money on a webcam than, than, than here where I'm in my, the privacy of my, my own home. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot more remote. People have learned that the business meetings maybe don't have to be in person. Education can probably be online. Uh, right. f- food is now delivery. Um, all these. Yeah, things. no, no question. Vegas is going to change. But earlier, too, you were saying that you're not sure if Vegas may recover fully because of uh, COVID. What were your thoughts behind that? So I'm concerned about Vegas not recovering uh, or not recovering to where it was February. I think it's going to take a little bit longer to get there. Now, for an entrepreneur, I, there are tremendous opportunities that are coming. Absolutely tremendous opportunities in, the, in, in nightlife, restaurants, all aspects of hospitality. If I was your age, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to Las Vegas. Sad because you're having an economic shift. But I was around in 2008, and I know guys from investment banking that became billionaires because they took advantage of in a good way of the changing market situation. Now, how many people are gonna come to Vegas in the next couple of months until there's a vaccine? You know, we depend on conventions. And and some of the things that we're doing is, we're gonna have a drive-in discount. So if you drive in from California or Utah or, or, you know, one of the states, we'll give you a discount, whether it be on our app or at the restaurant or something like that. But I'm concerned that like Station said, we're not gonna reopen a bunch of the hotels. You know, the hotels are going to open very slowly because convention business is down. I think a lot of people don't realize that how dependent we are on conventions. You know, it's like, great, we've got a lot of tourists, but the tourists come in a lot of times the weekends. Tuesday through Thursday, however, you still have to eat. And it was the conventions that take up some of that. So I think we're going to see a contraction. Do you need 200,000 hotel rooms, which we currently have now? Do you need, I, I mean, I've talked to at least 20 restaurants that have said to me, even with a government bailout, not sure they can make it back because they've got rotting food and old rent and, you know, things going bad. And then they're starting up pure again, they're starting up fresh again. And it's like, ah, oh, and if there's distancing, so the rent is based on having a lot of people in the restaurant. My, I can fit 200 people in my restaurant at capacity. But if the government says, hey, you can only have 25, it's different economics. 
You know, it's different. Uh, uh, it's a different business model. If I'm mostly takeout and only have, you know, 10 people in the restaurant. So I think that the casinos are built on having 60, 70% occupancy to be profitable. How are you going to have that? Are they going to sell $5,000 tables anymore? It, it's, it's a real, I mean, and you've seen like a couple of high end spots like Joel Robichon over at uh, MGM not coming back because they don't think there's going to be a high end. One of the best restaurants in New York City called 11 Madison Park, uh, literally one of the best restaurants uh, uh, in the world. They said yesterday, we can't make it. We're not going to be able to come back because the 1% high end dining isn't going to be there anymore. Even the rich people that used to come here, they want takeout now. And we don't think we can deliver good takeout. Now for us, when I'm hearing, oh, the trend from the lowest uh, 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 segment of the buying population to the highest buying population wants takeout, for a business person, that's, uh, uh, that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> from a, uh, um, from a, uh, if, but I don't, ha I can, my business model is flexible where I don't have to uh, uh, have a certain number of people coming in to the city every week to pay the overhead on my place. You know, from a, a survival standpoint, our places, uh, both the blind pig and the things we're looking at, can survive basically on delivery traffic, locals, and uh, uh, calculated experimentation. Um, but uh, uh, can they do that at the Cosmo? Can they do that at you know the link? I, yeah. I don't know. Are you going to want to go on the wheel? That <laughs> sanitize the wheel every time. That oh, that's too. That's just like the definition of not social distancing. <laughs> How are you going to go on the New York, New York uh, uh, roller coaster? My kid loves to go on that. We're going to wait in that tight little line, and then we're going to grab onto the same uh, uh, thing that uh, uh, the same rail that the guy behind me just grabbed onto, and then we're going to go. Uh, it's, it's real, but the airlines have the same problem. So how do you do a connection, right? So the connections, the the, the tight connections to make the airlines. Uh, hub and spoke system work don't work anymore when it takes two hours to desanitize an airline. Yeah, I saw I saw that they just shut down the New York subway for the first time in like 116 years. At night to clean it. Yeah, yeah at night to clean it because there's no other way to do it. And I've taken the New York subway at 3.30 in the morning. I've taken it at 4 o'clock in the morning, going, coming, getting a flight to come out here where you got to be at the airport two hours ahead of time. So it's like it changes a lot of things and it changes travel, changes tourism, changes it changes hospi hospitality from the restaurant to the club to the spa are you going to go is there going to be ladies coming in to go to the spa at the hotel while the husband's downstairs gambling yeah so and until there's a vaccine i think even at post a vaccine people are still going to look at every everyday transactions and everyday movements differently because of this sanitation now, of course alcohol. If you transact in Bitcoin, you don't have to worry about touching the dirty money with the uh, Ex uh, virus on it. Exactly. All digital, baby. That's um... right. Exactly. I could just send it to you and uh, that's the end of it. Dude, with, uh, with, with more coin, what is the uh, transaction time on that? Do you know? Oh, it, I, it, it's never been very long. I mean, it's always been uh, uh, under three minutes. So uh, uh, it runs on top of Ethereum. It's never been a... Uh, uh, it's never been... Uh, that it's not... Was never it's not like Bitcoin where it could take up to an hour almost. No, no, no. The transaction time, the confirmation time is uh, over. And, and with more, remember that I know most of our members, they're members. So I know them ahead of time. So it's like they're not trying to get over on me because they want to come to the club next month or they want to rent a, you know, we used to rent them Lamborghinis for crypto, whether it was more or whether it was Bitcoin. We had a deal in town where you could rent exotic cars and the members got a discount. So it was like the ultimate crypto discount insider club that's yeah it's perfect a way to to implement especially with the restaurant ghost and ghost restaurant business uh, my question too is since vegas is going to have a tough time recovering and you see huge influx into the virtual restaurant and ghost kitchen business will, will your kitchen specifically be able to handle a huge amount of volume um so now i can handle a huge amount of volume right now now we can handle uh, uh, now we can handle that. Um, the goal is that not we would own or be a partner in the actual brand. And fortunately or unfortunately, um, there are 
many, many, many restaurants that are in the, across the country that are not coming back, right? So landlords are gonna have to do something with this space. So if we have the virtual kitchen brand and it's working, we can do an interesting deal for that space. So either we can hire a local operator, partner with a local restaurant that's going out of a, a business, lease or buy the space and scale it, uh, uh, scale it that way. Um, in Las Vegas, um, I, I could tell you that we would have no problem on, uh, um, on scaling only because if for some reason our place got uh, too full, uh, there are 10 kitchens that would beg to uh, uh, service our, uh, uh, our customers. <laughs> uh, because you got a 6,000, 7,000 square foot restaurant and you can't put any people in there. It's a problem. That's a, that's a benefit to you guys. And I've noticed too that the government's been looking a little bit towards or differently towards alcohol. And maybe in the future, you guys will be able to deliver alcohol because I know even now they're doing curbside pickup for, for alcohol services. Alcohol is a, a, an interesting, uh, uh, is an interesting, it, it'll change. I mean, for some of these places to survive, not just us, but for some of these places to survive, they're going to have to incorporate alcohol delivery. They're going to have to evolve you know, what the thinking, which is based on decades ago that run these alcohol licensing laws, um, and not just here, but around the country. And because I, I, I see it firsthand in Los Angeles, too. And, and they're a little bit more aggressive than we are here, as far as because they know that for bars and restaurants to survive, they're going to have to at least embrace delivering cocktails, delivering, uh, uh, you know, a six six things of margaritas for Cinco de Mayo to somebody's house. And there's enough margin in alcohol where you can do it. I mean, there's an absolute enough margin where uh, uh, that can, uh, uh, that can work. So uh, a lot of things are going to have to change and <clears throat> it's nice to get bailouts, but those will end and you're going to have to fundamentally change licensing and those kind of regulations from federal government on down. Yeah. And in, in recessions is where the Goliaths are built. Like in the last recession, it was like Uber and a bunch of these different innovative businesses. So there'll be the next wave of innovation in Goliaths. No question. Out of the rubble, out of the chaos, genius and significant amounts of money are going to, uh, uh, are going to be created. I mean, there's no, uh, uh, <clears throat> the virus will get solved at some point. We don't know if it's tomorrow or, you know, a year from now, hopefully. And, uh, uh, but between tomorrow and that, that vaccine, there's a lot of change. And the other thing I'm seeing is people who are in their 60s and 70s who own business businesses tapping out. They're like, I don't have the strength for this anymore. I, I, I'm, you know, first of all, I might be putting my health at risk by going to my company or my work, and it's not just a restaurant. It's an advertising agency. It's a car dealership. It's whatever. So you're seeing a generational change now that uh, uh, it's like, okay, time to sell, time to merge, time to close outright or time to give the business to my, uh, uh, my children. Yeah. Just locally we saw, I forget what the brewery's name was, but it had been around for almost 40 years, just closed down. I saw a handful of other, uh, 30 plus your, your businesses in Vegas closing down because of yeah, that. It's tough to answer the bell at some point. It's tough to say you, you step back and you say, Hey, maybe I don't want to do this anymore. Maybe it's, it's, maybe this is a sign from God or it's just a time for me to, to, to retire and, uh, uh, and move on. So you're seeing, you know, the, the businesses that are having economic issues and then businesses that are having generational change. And out of that, the next Uber, the next Airbnb, the next uh, uh, whatever is coming. Hey, the next dominant ghost kitchen is coming right. at you. As, next, long, as long as you in integrate useful experiences. I mean, with the uh, illegalization of marijuana and CBD, I know that you've been venturing down that industry as well. You can have the CBD infused food or products as well as maybe my pitcher of sangria. And right. That's the that. future. I mean, I mean that with, you know, uh, uh, liberalization of some of the alcohol laws uh, and infused dining. And I mean, that's where the market is going now. I mean, so it's, it's, this has accelerated that trend. Um, and we've never done, uh, al uh, we've never done uh, CBD or marijuana business in, in Las Vegas. It's been in Los Angeles, um, but it's coming. I mean, it's not just coming here. We're also looking at Michigan and some of the other states where uh, uh, things have uh, uh, already been legalized. But um, that's, remember, the county's not making any money. There's no sales tax being generated anymore. 
There's no room taxes being generated anymore. Things, if, if things are gonna have to change, alternative sources of revenue are gonna need to come in for all the states in, in, uh, in the country, not yeah, just right. Las Vegas. Yeah, that's why uh, marijuana was deemed essential, right? And now they even just moved to uh, curbside pickup for marijuana because the marijuana industries were hurting. One of my friends who works at a dispensary was saying that the rules that were in place, they were only allowed to deliver up to five uh, marijuana sales at a time per car delivery. Yeah. You know, so if it takes an hour to deliver five, their business is cut more than half is what I've heard. That's terrible. Yeah. And I, I never thought of it that way. But yeah, no, there's no question that uh, uh, that these type of things um, that were considered marginal or fringe or emerging will emerge a lot quicker when the cities and states and, and governments are having significant budget shortfalls. And it's not just it's education. It's, it's, it's fire. It's police. It's vital services. And so there's going to have to be some kind of liberalization uh, because uh, Tax revenue has got to be made up. Yeah, maybe you will see uh, virtual uh, restaurants delivered to places like the school that are tired of uh, kids that just don't want to eat the, the shitty lunch food. <laughs> What's funny is, is that one school in Summerlin said we're banning Uber Eats drivers because their parents are sending too many of them to the school. <laughs> we can't manage them. So give your kid the lunch ahead of time. But yes, um, we've been focused. We've been doing a lot of catering right? Small businesses that don't want their employees to go out that are still operating will call us and we'll bring five pizzas or 10 sandwiches or things like that. And they're eating them at their desk. They're eating them six feet apart in the conference room. Um, the business lunch out in the restaurants going away. It's going to be, you know, the makeshift dining, dining room that's going to be created in some of these corporations, both locally and nationally, because do I want to go to a restaurant? I can't take more than four, four or six people to a thing, to a, to a restaurant under the current distancing suggestion. So what do you do? Bring it in. Yeah, a hundred percent. And what is the, through your guys' market research and analysis, what's the most common food products that are being delivered? Pizza. The, in the current, look, so there's no re room for culinary experimentation in the current crisis. It's pizza, hamburgers, chicken sandwiches, the occasional girlfriend salad and desserts. Those are the menu items that are across the board requested. That is the one where everybody wants to feel good, everyone wants to feel safe, and that's what they're ordering. There is no experiment, there's no room for experimentation uh, when that, uh, uh, in the current world. Now, when things change, a virtual restaurant and a ghost kitchen will be an amazing spot to experiment. So, um, and I think people will take chances if you price it correctly. Yeah, I've seen a few. I've seen a few people order uh, takeout sushi from some from some of these places. I don't know personally how I feel about it, but I think once a crisis is done, if you could create some sort of vehicle to transport it from the restaurant to delivery, I don't know if that's whether an oven or something to keep the product cold. Your uh, options become limitless. Pizza travels, hamburgers travel, chicken sandwiches mm -hmm. travel, all that stuff travels. I've stayed away from sushi only because if you can't do it reasonably well, and I like to do things, we like to do things awesome, um, you stay away because there's too much margin in, in, in the other things that we know what we're doing. Now isn't the time for an education. Now is the time to do what you do well uh, and scale it. Yeah, 100%. My issue only, and I'm sure you've, you've thought of multiple ways to combat this, is the the downtime of the food from when it's cooked to the point of delivery. And sometimes it becomes cold. That's the reason that's turned me off from delivery. Um, have you thought of any ways to fix this? Very difficult. Um, it, is a, it is not just a, a Las Vegas problem. It's an industry problem. Um, one of the easiest ways to fix it is, of course, um, order from someplace close. You know, that's the, the so our thinking long term is we will have, four or five uh, ghost kitchens near centers of population. So you'll get the same, um, you'll get the same experience, uh, whether you're ordering from the Dean Martin location and we're just walking it up to Panorama and it's still, it's still very hot versus if you ordered it and then drove it out to somewhere in Summerlin where it would be soggy and, uh, uh, soggy and cold. So um, the way to really deal with that is uh, multiple locations and to have um, you pick a city and you put 
four different spots. Uh, and it can be, if you don't have the big overhead, it can be done very, very profitably. Distributing the system. It's the trend, Correct. the trend of the future. Correct. I, all those miners all over. <laughs> the kitchen miners in the oven. <laughs> yes. Exactly correct. That's funny. Um, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope one day in the future, uh, once my audience grows, that I'll be able to sponsor a restaurant and we, can, <laughs> we, we could come up with uh, multiple ideas from that. You know, yeah, I, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, there, literally, there is no, I mean, it's the most interesting time as far as expanding something goes, you know, and you have to think of food as like the commodity. And it's been either, I know it's my local place or I know the chef, or I like this type of, uh, I like this type of food. But uh, uh, now it's like, how interesting would it have been to, although I don't know, somebody's like, oh, you should have the Tiger King Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm not sure that really lends itself to an exciting menu like that. But uh, uh, there are, there are, I mean, I've done a lot of things with niche in, in niche and, and affinity businesses. And if somebody had the, you know, their favorite NASCAR driver's virtual cafe, or they tied it in with a residency and you tied in the food, the hotel, the concert ticket and the meet and greet all in one, right? When people come and land here, they don't know what to order. So if they know, oh, I'm going to get something from the Aerosmith cafe, or I'm going to get, I'm going to try Dana's Boston clam chowder. All of a sudden that's kind of, it, it enhances the, uh, the experience. So um, those are the kind of projects that, uh, uh, that lend themselves very well to a uh, uh, virtual cafe. I don't know if Tiger King does, but I mean, I'd be willing to listen. <laughs> yeah, the, mar the marketability of pop culture we know is drastic. I mean, the strip capitalized on is what he, as many as other industries as well. But I, the huge sign that I see is that you're able to capture different cultures that maybe aren't pop culture or different uh, fads of diets. Like for example, I did keto for almost a mm. year at one point, but there's no keto restaurants anywhere. So if you could nope. get, you could get somebody who's leading like a gym enthusiast, who's leading the keto movement to come in and sponsor a keto restaurant, you pick up all of those, all those people. There are, there's a number of different ways. Keto, halal, kosher, all of these different ty types have been uh, uh, been been either discussed internally or pitched to us uh, uh, externally. And you know, when you want to start a restaurant, it's a minimum of a half a million dollars to get everything up and running and to get started. You can build out the restaurant and the menu on the app for you know, ten grand. So, so if I wanted to sponsor, let's say, a kosher restaurant, I am Jewish. I have a huge Jewish following here and friends. How much it would cost me ten k to sponsor for like a week, or did you Depending split the on difference? I have a funny story about trying to find a kosher restaurant during the Cannes Film Festival with a Orthodox friend of mine for we'll save it for another day. But uh, um, so uh, that depending on the kitchen requirements could be done, uh, uh, could be done very, uh, uh, very inexpensively. And so, so uh, if you're sponsoring it, you just put up a front cost and then the profits are split at whatever the uh, split whatever is. Whatever the, the real estate and the food and the, I mean, mm -hmm. the real estate, meaning the, the kitchen operation costs and the, uh, the ingredient cost. The key with all of these that I tell people um, is you gotta have a following, right? If you have a following, um, I don't care that your relatives say you make the best pumpkin pie or chicken sandwich or whatever, but if you have a million followers, you will be able to translate that in, it's a, it's a brand extension. It's another way, to, uh, uh, another way to get revenue from the brand you've already, uh, already built. Yeah. So um, that's just, a, you know, we're, we're taking the, the the t-shirt and putting the, the, the guns and roses logo on. <laughs> and you know, there are, it's all prices. You can have the $25 shirt all the way up to the $500 shirt that sells at some upscale boutique on, uh, uh, you know, Melrose Avenue or in one of the casino shops. So really you just have to be able to monetize your following. Yeah. A hundred percent. Cause a lot of times when you go test out new restaurants, it's through word of word of mouth. It's uh, through a recommendation of a friend. But if your friend is sponsoring this restaurant, you're much more likely to go uh, yeah. indulge in it. If it's your affinity group, if you're, it's your, your, uh, if you're already invested in the brand, um, you would be able to uh, say, look, you'll at least get them in the door. Now it's the restaurant's job or the chef's job 
to deliver a, a experience that is consistent with the brand. But at the same time, if they do, the customer will always come back. 100%. This, this concept is mutually beneficial for both. You put the marketing onto the person who's sponsoring it, and then you just leave the cooks in the kitchen to do the work that they need as far as the objective preparations. And sadly, um, there are many, many very, very talented cooks and chefs in this city and others that are looking for work or looking for creative outlets. Oh, a hundred percent. Peter, this is uh this has been an amazing conversation. I love, I love it, especially the crypto part because it's, it's, it's on the eve of the having and, right. no question. and, and you're big into entrepreneurship and you can see the need to pivot in critical times. And there are so many people that are saying, I've always had my own restaurant and I got to have people coming in, but I just don't know how I'm going to do it anymore. And I'm like, what's your skill? Your skill is the menu, the food, uh, and, and you, know, you already have an audience. So build on that. You don't have to have the physical location. I say, how many cars does Uber own? What does Facebook own? How, how many hotels does Airbnb own? But there's, there's a, a stuck thinking with some of the, the uh, uh, certainly I've seen it locally in the restaurant space where I must have a brick and mortar location with a sign and a hostess and, and waiters and waitresses. And you'll get back there. But today to survive, you've got to adjust to what the marketplace is. Dude, yeah. Actually, now that I just thought too, a lot of what's trending too, I see it more in California is a lot of the popular street vendors who have like a side cart in front of their house or on the corner that are becoming very popular. So if you could cater toward that, towards them and scale it. Let's keep the overhead low until you have a customer base and then scale and then you get successful. Oh, I love it. A hundred percent. I want to dive into this down the road once the following uh, a cruise in Vegas. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> So yeah. I got, I have uh, two questions for you before, before we leave. Um, these are the questions that I ask everybody. Um, let's say, let's say we're 10 years from now, it's 2030. What is the landscape of Cordia Kitchens and the virtual restaurant business? So Cordia Kitchens is publicly traded. So it has a symbol and it, it, it trades over the counter and hopefully we will have either become the dominant largest uh, provider of uh, ghost kitchen and uh, um, virtual restaurants, or we've been we've been acquired, uh, right? So you always have to have both. You know, when people start businesses, I always ask them, "How are you going to end it? What's your exit strategy?" Because um, the exit ends ends coming. It's just a question of do you want how do you want to direct it? Um, so the the goal is either to get big or to sell to somebody bigger. And I did that in credit cards. I had like a small portfolio and ended up selling that. Uh, to a bigger institution that took it over. So um, that's the same thing that I see here. Uh, use the current climate to round up modestly at like 100 locations in the next two years around the country uh, that are ghost and virtual, and then find an exit strategy. I like that. And final question is, what does Las Vegas mean to you? Las Vegas means opportunity. I think that Las Vegas, Las Vegas is an opportunity uh, to take advantage of the fact that it's the crossroads of the world, the fact that it is a home for innovation, the fact that it is a mostly, not 100%, but mostly friendly business climate. And I think that there is a great base of people here um, that uh, rally around the right idea. So those four items are what Las Vegas, uh, when I think of Las Vegas. I don't think of the strip. I don't think of girls. I don't think of the clubs. I think of the business aspect and the opportunity that's here. Yeah, a lot of people saw it. Las Vegas was one of the most moved into cities across the United States last year. No question. No question. Um, so if people want to get involved in Cordia Kitchens or they want to follow you personally, uh, what are the links to that? Um, they could go to CordiaKitchens.com. They could go to... Uh, Cordia Kitchen on Instagram. Uh, they could go to Cordia Kitchens on Twitter, or they could go to my favorite, Get More Coin, uh, for the <laughs> nightclub experience. So, a hundred percent. I'm actually i u i use i use Bitrix, so I'm actually going to have to look into that even more too. <laughs> Great guys who run Bitrix, safe. Trust them with my life. Just an amazing, uh, uh, you know, 
Seattle based and just a, uh, uh, just a great situation. So. That is perfect. Also, if you guys are hungry, order from the blind pig. If you're in the strip rest or by the, the strip. And even if you're not, Uber will deliver to you. So. Perfect. Peter, this was an amazing talk. Thank you for reaching out and I hope we can be some sort of partner in the future. Yeah. Come down to the restaurant when thing, when, when we can have visitors again, come down. Oh, hundred percent. I'll be in there. Thank you again, Peter. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, comment, and subscribe on whatever platform you're on. Like seriously, stop right now. Stop what you're doing. If you're on YouTube, upvote, give us a comment, and hit that subscribe button. If you're on Spotify, hit that subscribe. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, hit the subscribe. Scroll down a little bit. Give us a five-star review and leave a comment on your thoughts on the episode or the podcast in general. This all helps push the podcast forward up into the limelight and so that we can set a grand stage for Las Vegas as a whole. If you guys are interested and want to follow us on social media, please follow us at the guest list pod on Instagram. And if you're interested in myself, follow me at Jake Allen on Instagram or at Jake Allen underscore on Twitter. Thank you guys and catch us next week.